Okay, guys, I think we're going to make a start. Um, if anyone else is uh, running a bit late, they can join us a little bit further on. So, Jim and Amy, can I ask you to turn off, please? Just for... Yeah, stop video and mute. Yeah, so I'll do yes, that. Please. Okay, guys. Um, welcome. Hello, good evening and welcome. Um, I... I'm really excited about this talk and I hope that you guys are too. Um, it's our mental health talk tonight. It conveniently links in with Ch Children's Mental Health Week, which I'm sure you're all aware about is this week. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, I just want to quickly go over a couple of very brief house housekeeping bits. Um, firstly, if I could ask you all to keep your microphones and videos off, um, that would just help with the smooth running of the webinar itself. Um, secondly, if you want to ask a question uh, for the Q&A section, uh, please feel free to enter it into the chat function. There's a Q&A function down below at the bottom of your screen. And at, that, at any point during the webinar, you can ask any questions that you would like. And we will try and go through as many of the questions as possible at the end in that dedicated section that we've got after the talk. Um, also, if your questions are in relation to a child of a particular age or an individual of a particular age, perhaps, um, it would be useful to put that in the chat so that we can try and get a personalised answer as much as possible. As I'm sure you can appreciate, we have uh, parents tonight from the prep school, we have parents from the senior school and we also have Old Brentwood. So we're dealing with a wide range of individuals here that the questions could be referring to. Um, Thirdly and finally, this talk is being recorded um, and potentially will be shared with the Brentwood community. So there are a few parents that have signed up for this already who can't make it tonight. So we'll be sharing it there and also with old Brentwoods in case it's of interest. OK, so on to the main event. Uh, as you're all aware, tonight our guest speaker is Jim Brown, who is a former teacher uh, at Brentwood School for 35 years and held many positions of authority there, as well as um, being a pastoral leader. Jim is also an old Brentwood um, and attended the school from 1968 to 1975, although I'm not sure he'll be too happy with me revealing the date. Um, following his time at Brentwood School, uh, Jim has been a non-executive director of Mental Health First Aid from 2015 to 2020. And he has spoken to businesses such as JP Morgan, and helped oversee a program of government funded training um, for over 2000 state schools um, and over 2000 state school teachers themselves as well. And that was in his role as a mental health first aider. He is also an educational consultant assisting with the Commonwealth program and was part of the Commonwealth delegation to India and Ireland in 2019. Additionally, Jim has also become somewhat of a celebrity for commuters as he does voiceover work and can currently be heard on the circle and district lines. So be prepared to stand clear of the doors and enjoy the talk. I'm going to hand over to Jim now and I hope you enjoy the talk. Well, thank you, Jenny, and for those kind words and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brown, James Brown, and I'm delighted to be involved in Brentwood School's Learning Community Programme, especially during National Children Mental Health Awareness Week. Welcome to you, the young and the not so young, and I believe a three-year-old has a special dispensation to wear his pyjamas for this Zoom session, and that his six-year-old sister had some rather direct advice for me, um, which was, don't be boring Jimbo. And I'm very pleased that their mum, Amy McEwen, is able to join us tonight. Uh, she is an award-winning health, mental health and wellbeing consultant, and will be available through the question and answer session. We also have people logged in from different parts of the world, from the Commonwealth, including India, Australia, New Zealand, plus South Africa, Ghana, and a number of countries in Europe, and of course, the UK, especially Essex. Well, 
Beginning Brave Conversations is the title of tonight's talk, or BBC for short. During lockdown, listening to the BBC News intro theme is one of the few excitements which we can all still participate in as a group. And I will now play this in the background as I give a rundown of what I intend to cover. So here we go. Coming up tonight on Beginning Brave Conversations. The need to look after ourselves, both physically and mentally. A workout to the Harry Styles single, Treat People With Kindness. How to promote self-help through stress awareness. Recommending a number of ways we can be preventative and keep ourselves mentally in shape. How to have those all important 10 minute chats to guide a person towards the right support. The importance of schools and the challenge of homeschooling. The influence of the digital age. A question and answer session. But always remembering to be proud and be like the greatest showman class and tell everyone, this is me. So the first point in the rundown I made was the need to look after ourselves both physically and mentally. So let's begin with looking after ourselves physically. In a moment, I'm gonna get everyone to stand up as we're going to physically stretch ourselves to Harry Styles' latest single, Treat Everyone With Kindness. And by exercising, we will release endorphins and make ourselves feel good, just like the James Brown song, in fact. So how do we do that? Well, at the risk of sounding like a rather ancient Joe Wicks, we can do that by four simple body movements. And the first one is wriggling our shoulders. So we can just sit there and wriggle our shoulders. And when you wriggle your shoulders, you tend to look like gangsters, I think, when you do that. So I'm gonna call that the gangster move. So that's our first move. And the second move is bobbing our head from side to side. And this is known as the quo because it's like status quo. If you remember when they were rocking all over the world, they used to go one, two, one, two, one, two. So we get that for the quo. And then our third movement is stretching out our arms. And just think back to those disco times in the late seventies where you had Saturday night fever. So I'm gonna call this the Travolta. So we're gonna go one, two, three, one, or one, two, three, one. And then the final bit of movement we're gonna have is going to be running on the spot. And for this, we're going to have the fastest man in the world as the name, and that's Usain Bolt. So I'm going to call that the Bolt. So we've got four movements we're going to be doing. We're going to do the Gangster, we're going to be doing the Quo, we're going to be doing the Travolta, and we're going to be doing the Bolt. Now, I will tell you when to start, start these movements, but first um, I'm going to see if I can call in Harry Styles here and make sure that he gets singing, and then we will make ourselves stand up and here we go so let's see if we can get ourselves here and we'll just let harry come in and say a few words to begin with and we now start off by doing wiggling our shoulders so in other words off we go for the gangster that's very good that's excellent, Mr. Sawyer. I can see you're getting into this well. And after wriggling our shoulders, we're going to do the quo next. That means we're going to move our necks. And we're going to go one, two, one, two, one, two. And that's very impressive by you, Mr. Barfield. And now we're going to see if we can move our arms. And so this is Travolta. And here we go. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's great, Subu. And Emily, I can see your cats are joining in there as well. So, so far, so good. And now the final movement is the bolt. So we start moving nicely, moving ourselves forward. I've got my eye on you, iPad number five. I can't see much movement going on there at all. So let's keep it going. And we stand still for a moment. And we go back to the gangster. So let's wriggle our shoulders. Fantastic. 
Well done, Trevor and Colin. Much better than when we were in India when we did this. And we're off to next. And the quote. Very good indeed. Well done, Rob. You're moving well. And then it's the Travolta bit. Here we go. One, two, one, two. Oh, yes. Travolta at his best. And I can see many people joining in this bit. And we'll have a final run in when Harry finishes this bit. And here we go. It's okay. And I'm moving towards switching Harry off because there's only so much Harry you can have in life. And there we go. So well done, Harry Styles. And well done, everybody. Let's sit down and let's give ourselves a virtual round of applause for the way in which we managed to do that so well. So I think on balance, we all feel better after that. And this was done really to illustrate the fact that we seem to know how to look after ourselves physically. So let's move on to how we can look after ourselves mentally. We have our minds which need stretching in a different way. We know that we have to rest our bodies if we feel physically tired or run down. But our minds can also become tired and overloaded at times. And then there is a need to rest and relax our minds. If you have a broken leg, physical first aid is perhaps easy to identify. But if you have a traumatic experience, such as a close friend or relative passing away or a friendship breakup, perhaps examination pressures, lockdown pressures or work pressures, this is much more difficult to identify. This is where some mental health first aid can come in through perhaps conversations people listening to each other and being understanding or just clearing your mind through relaxation. Now, one way to view mental health side of your body is to perhaps see yourself as a jigsaw. Now, jigsaws have become very popular during lockdown, completed by people such as the Duchess of Cambridge, a very public supporter of children's mental health awareness, and Gareth Southgate, the England football manager. Now with a jigsaw, there is a picture to look at to begin with, if you like the complete person. Sometimes putting a jigsaw together can go well. Other times it doesn't seem easy, especially if a piece is missing. So think about the picture of yourself on that jigsaw box. Do you want to change it? Can you keep it all together? And do you need some help putting the pieces together? We don't expect people to be experts in mental health, but we can observe changes in behavior or performance. So how can we keep ourselves or others in good shape mentally and be preventative? The next section I want to deal with is how to be stress aware and seek to reduce that stress. And I'm going to suggest a number of ways you can do this. So the first question to ask yourself is, how much sleep do I get at night? Is it four or five hours? Really, it should be about seven or eight hours of sleep. And then when you'll feel really refreshed, you'll feel as though you can really face the day if you've had a good sleep. And how, how do you approach your diet? Well, think about those biscuits being too readily available, the snacks you have. What you need to have is perhaps a diet which is balanced. And when was the last time you had a long conversation with a friend, a loved one or a colleague, talking and exchanging views by phone, by bubble or Zoom? These are very rewarding and stress reducing activities. Think about how long you might be on your computer, PlayStation or phone at night as well. Try to stick to a time when you are going to switch these devices off and give your mind a chance to wind down and log off as well. One thing lockdown has encouraged rather bizarrely is people engaging in long walks or being outside as, as much as it is allowed. And fresh air is very therapeutic. So get outside for that fresh air. Ring fence some time for some mindful relaxation. Perhaps clear your mind. Different ways could be yoga or just sitting quietly, browsing a magazine or a paper. 
Now, have you thought about exploring a new hobby or skill? Now, this can be very rewarding. This fits in with the aims of this year's Children's Mental Health Awareness Week, which is all about expressing yourself. That's finding creative ways of children sharing their thoughts or feelings through such activities, such as drama. So you could, for instance, uh, perhaps join a local, local drama area on Zoom, such as Stage Crazy, or dance, where if you visit the BAFTA YouTube channel, you can dance with Oti Mabuti. Photography, art, music or poetry. Find those things which make you feel good about yourself. Now, one of the main organisations behind Ch Children's Mental Health Week is the charity Place to Be, which has materials on its website available for downloading. And also, you can visit the baftakids.org site, where there are plenty of things for people to visit there as well. Now, children and young people should be encouraged to try something new, build confidence, and begin to feel good about themselves. And I read in the recent Brentwood School Times how Mr Bond has used the time during lockdown to try to play the piano himself again. So do things which make you feel good and relieve the stress. I found painting fences to be very rewarding in lockdown, and I enjoyed telling everyone about my progress. <laughs> and in fact, now I have a waiting list of people who want me to paint their fence. I also read about a number of well-being dogs being available out on site at the school campus as a source of comfort and relaxation. And I've already had the privilege of meeting one of them, George. Similarly, pets at home can fulfill this role of a stress sharer. There are also a number of ways in which stress can be relieved through self-help. So consider that, consider that you can help yourself. But the next section deals with how sometimes self-help is not enough. And that is when a mental health first aider might be a good first port of call in trying to guide a person towards the right support. So a 10 minute chat can be the first step on that journey. Now, here are some pointers as to how to have that brave conversation. First of all, choose where to chat. People are more willing to talk about their feelings in a relaxed and comfortable setting. Secondly, make sure that there's a hot drink, perhaps a hot chocolate or something like that, or a glass of water, something which people can hold. I think that's very important that they feel at ease. So they've got a venue which they like, you've got uh, perhaps something to drink as well. And so you don't want to be disturbed, so turn your phone off. And how do you go about keeping the conversation going? Talking tips, if you like. Well, keep the chat supportive, exploring the issues and how you may be able to help. Do not offer glib advice such as pull yourself together or uh, cheer up and keep your body language open and non-confrontational. Now be empathetic and take them seriously. And what sort of useful questions can you ask? Well, you can say, how are you feeling at the moment? How long have you felt like this? Is this an ongoing issue? Who do you feel you can go to for support? Or what can we do to help? And how do we help others? And the next thing is to listen. This might seem a bit silly explaining how to listen, but the way to do it is to give the person your full focus. Their words, their tone of voice and body language will give clues as to how they are feeling. Demonstrate that you hear and understand what they're saying or feeling. Don't interrupt or try to fill those silences. Listen non-judgmentally, do not criticise because of your own attitudes or beliefs, and show that you accept and respect them as they are. And so what happens next? Well, reassure them that support is available. If they feel they need more support, encourage them to seek it uh, through their GP. 
the NHF websites, Every Mind Matters Hub and Every Mind Matters COVID-19 Hub are also available. Plus mental health charities such as MIND, the Mental Health Foundation and the MIND Info Line. I know that Brentwood School has just launched a wellbeing portal, which will be circulated by heads of year. Possibly you could seek support privately through a therapist, but keep in touch, follow up and ask them how they're doing. Now, the next section of the talk deals with the role of school and homeschooling. These are challenging times with homeschooling continuing until at least March the 8th. As we all know, schools are so much more than just a place where you pass exams. The teenage years are the transitional stage from dependent children to autonomous adult. As part of this process, our relationship with our families when we're teenagers tend to have more conflict as we strive for independence. Peer relationships are therefore crucially important for social development and for the development of self-identity at this stage. And the current lockdown makes this even more difficult. So young people are not always the best verbal communicators. So it is important to be listening to all their forms of communication. So consider their words carefully, but pay close attention to their actions and body language. If you encounter encounter a behavior that concerns you, ask them what is happening for them that would lead them to behave in that way, rather than asking why they are behaving in that way. So try and look beyond the surface. Often, young people are attempting to protect us or themselves from difficult feelings. They need to know that they are allowed to communicate their feelings about being isolated or separated from their peers. Now, my final section deals with the role of the dig digital age and how it affects different groups of teenagers. Some teenagers tend to engage socially through conversations about shared interests, while some tend to engage through shared activities like team sports. While shared conversations can continue virtually, at least to some extent, it is much more difficult to transfer some of the key ways in which the shared activities teenager can socially connect into digital space. Often this takes the form of resorting to endless online gaming. And since its launch in November, the PlayStation 5 has become hot property. It is the fantasy outdoor activity. And as for real outdoor activity, make the most of it and pray for some more snow. So to sum up, in this important week of children's mental health awareness, I've endeavored to explore how we look after ourselves physically and how we look after ourselves mentally the ways in which we can reduce stress in our lives, how we can seek help and how we can help others, the important role of schools and the challenge of homeschooling, and finally, the influence of the di digital age on our behavior. These are hugely challenging times for us all. We need to find those ways to share our thoughts and feelings. Try not to say I'm very busy and haven't got time. Find the time. We need to help each other to promote self-worth. Congratulate and celebrate success when they happen. This is not to say we won't have our ups and downs. For as Martin Luther King once said, only when it is dark enough can we see the stars. So, ladies and gentlemen, Let's be brave, have those conversations. Let's be proud. Believe in ourselves and reach for those stars. And as the greatest showman cast said, this is me. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jenny.
Thank you so much, Jim, um, for those words of advice. Um, I'm sure that many people uh, that are watching and listening at the moment have found a lot of stuff that they can take away from that and also can relate massively to the impact not only on them but maybe on their children of lockdown and how social um, interactions have been somewhat hampered at the moment. Um, so I'm sure that there's some comfort to be taken from all of those tips and tricks that you've given us today. Um, we are now going to move on to the Q&A portion of the evening and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. So please send those through um, via the Q&A function at the bottom if you have any questions. Um, please, you know, you don't have to make them very specific. Um, you don't have to mention names or anything like that. Um, but we're here to help. Um, and as Jim has already said, we are delighted to have Amy McEwen, who is an award-winning health, mental health and wellbeing consultant, um, join us for this. And it's a chance for us to tap into her expertise in this field as well. So uh, thank you very much, Amy. Um, we've had a couple of questions. The first one is mainly, I've made a couple of notes here as well. Um, the first one is about, could you explain a bit more about what mental health first aider actually is? So what, what does that actually involve, Jim? Right. Well, uh, Mental Health First Aid is, uh, is a community interest company, and uh, that uh, became fully self-funded in 2009. And uh, it's uh, an organisation which has a chief executive, which is Simon Blake, and uh, it's got about 1,800 instructors. Uh, and they deliver mental health first aid courses, and those courses can be for supporting young people. It can be students in higher education, uh, armed forces, or the general adult population. And what they do, they run courses where people can become uh, a mental health first aider, which is a bit like being a physical first aider. So you're not going to be a total expert, but you're perhaps going to be able to uh, guide people to the next stage, as it were. And when I um, was on the board there, uh, I overviewed a program whereby we trained up 2000 state school teachers to be mental health first aiders. And we did a specifically designed one day course uh, for teachers. And we used to have what we called champion centers. Uh, and uh, people would then go to that school and have their training on one day. Because uh, if you want to become a mental health first aider, uh, perhaps in industry and so on. It's normally a three-day course. And obviously with teaching, you can't just leave school for three days. And uh, yeah. so we had to specially design a one-day course, uh, which uh, did a number of outline things there. So if people are interested in that, it is really learning how to do this sitting down and talking to people and then following things up. We have something called the ELGI Action Plan where you, first of all, assess the risk of harm, that you listen non-judgmentally, non that you give reassurance and information, you encourage appropriate professional help, and you encourage self-help and other support strategies. And that spells ELGE, A-L-G-E-E. -E. So that is um, something which, uh, uh, an acronym which you, you can remember. So yes, you can sign up for it, you can do it online these days, but let me just say that uh, mental health first aid hasn't got the monopoly on wisdom or the monopoly on what to do right. And I'm sure Amy might have something to add to that. Well, what I'd say about mental health first aid is, and, and I was on the board as well um, with Jim, is that it's a really good uh, awareness and literacy training tool. So it takes you through what stress is, what anxiety is, what depression is, what bipolar is, what schizophrenia is. It gives you a basic overview and understanding of what those mental illnesses are, which I think a lot of people in the general population don't have. And what it does is it encourages you to, to by giving information as to what it is, it takes some of the stigma out of it. What the, the, the concept of a mental health first aider is basically being able to have a conversation with somebody um, if you feel that person is in problem 
Um, so it's uh, it teaches you how to look for changes in people's behavior. So, I mean, that's the most common way to find a mental health issue is if someone around you suddenly starts changing in their behavior, either becoming withdrawn or becoming hyperactive or varying things. So mental health first aid is really good for understanding what common mental health disorders are, giving you the confidence to know how to talk to people and to, to start those difficult conversations. But as, as Jim said as well, it's also about signposting. So making sure that you're referring people either to the right NHS services or to the services you have at Brentwood School. Or um, something I always recommend to people as well is um, a website called Every Mind Matters that is a large government resource that's been put together by Mental Health First Aid England, Mind and all of the other charities, which has a lot of information about everything to do with mental health, plus all the spaces you can go and get support. Fantastic. Just to say to everyone, all of these um, organisations that we've spoken about tonight, when we follow up with you following the uh, talk, we'll make sure that we give you a list of all of these different organisations so that you could access them in your own time, have a look, see what you can find that will be useful for you. Um, brilliant. That's great, guys. Um, I've had another question that said, um, you mentioned starting a chat with a drink. Um, how do you guys feel about the idea of walking and talking instead? Well, um, yes, uh, I, there's, there's no, no monopoly on the right way to do things. And very often uh, walking and talking is good. I mean, what I would say is that um, you need to focus on the individual and uh, perhaps on a walk and a talk, um, there might be other things sort of going on in the background. The great thing about sitting down is that you've got uh, a closed environment in some ways where you can't be interrupted. Uh, so, I, and I think that's probably a, a good start, but I, I, that doesn't mean to say that I'm ruling out walking and talking because sometimes uh, the fresh air might stimulate conversation in a very positive way. I think that's something where you, you, you make a judgment. I also think one of, so firstly, the drink thing, you know, it can be useful to have a drink. If you're talking about an alcoholic drink, then that also could lead to other problems. So, you know, maybe having conversations without drinks. But one of the things that's quite useful if you do uh, go for a walk and a talk, uh, and I found this with my kids as well, is if you want to have deeper, meaningful conversations, sometimes not having eye contact and sitting, walking next to each other or sitting next to each other in a car is a good way of having personal conversations uh, you know, Jim's right in that you've got to show attention, but sometimes not looking directly at someone and just doing something alongside is a good way of getting people to start talking about things they might not. Yes, I've heard that about when you're in a car and if you're the one that's driving or if the other person is, it's often a way for your mind to be focusing on the road, but you're actually subconsciously being maybe a bit more open or honest than you maybe once would have been if you were sat thinking about your answers. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Not sitting looking at people. I think sometimes the most yeah. profound things my kids say or things come up when they're sort of sat in the <laughs> car next to you, you know? Yes. Yes, <laughs> no, definitely. Okay, and um, we've had another question. How best um can we how can we best get to sleep, sorry, and put aside the news and everything that's going on at the moment? Um and also handle any repeated headaches that might be going on because there's certainly a lot of information out there at the moment. And unfortunately, a lot of the news content, you can't really get away from uh, COVID-19, lockdown, et cetera. So how can we best sort of put that to one side as it were and get the good quality sleep that you've been talking about? So there's, so there's two things I would say um, is firstly, um, you know, I don't watch the news anymore. I don't watch it. I read it on my phone. So there's something about doing that because all of the um, advice on anxiety and trauma uh, shows that if you actually see images, it goes into you and penetrates your kind of uh, anxious system and your adrenal system thousands of times more if you're looking at images than reading. So given that the news is kind of everywhere at the moment, I've kind of stopped watching it on the news and instead choose to read it on an app because you're just reading text. I think if you are already anxious and your brain's worrying, that's quite a useful thing. And I think as Jim said at the beginning, you know, he's so right. The biggest thing happening at the moment is the BBC news, but we're all now locked into this very adrenal, we check the news every five minutes. Certainly for me, a big 
barometer for how stressed I am is how often I check the news. And I notice if I'm checking it regularly, it often means that I'm actually quite stressed out, maybe not realizing I am. So being very aware of how much news you're watching, being very aware of why you're watching it, but also how you're imprinting it into your anxious system is quite important. So maybe, you know, getting your news through reading a newspaper or reading the headlines as opposed to watching. The other thing I would say is there's some good apps out there now called Calm or Headspace or Mindfulness apps that are a nice thing. A lot of them have huge sections on sleep and are actually the sleep sections are what's used predominantly more than any other part of the app. So they're quite good things to get. And for parents out there, I have one, um, a CD I've called called Mindfulness and it's called Sitting Still Like a Frog. And that's uh, for kids who are five up. It's got different sections of different age groups. So I started teaching my daughter who has problems getting to sleep sometime that and we do it together. We sort of sit and do a mindfulness exercise on the floor in her room before she goes to bed. And then I leave the CD on for her to go to sleep, too. So they're all things like that that can, can help with sleep. Jim, you, I've, I've been answering. Have you got anything you'd like to add? Well, I, I think that's right. I think when you've got a busy household like you've got, then you can have to have different strategies for each particular age group. And, and I think certainly for, as I shall put it, the more mature person, I think it is managing the input of news into you and, and, and seeing that uh, if, if you're getting addicted towards it, then you need to try and, and cut it off more. And that doesn't mean to say that, that you have to go around with your head in the clouds, but I think you can be selective about what you look at and how long you're going to spend on things. Uh, and I think with, uh, with the children as well, I think it's something whereby, um, you know, one of the great things about um, the first lockdown was it was summer and they could run outside. Uh, I think the more challenging aspect of the latest lockdown has been, uh, you know, it's in winter, everybody's on top of each other. Um, I think yesterday afternoon you were out in the pouring rain, weren't you? Ace? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure many of the parents on this will have the same experiences that when you're homeschooling your children, they're not tired <laughs> in the same way because they're not <laughs> cycling to school. They're not with their friends. So you know, you're trying to keep any sense of a bedtime regime uh, and kids, you know, get, getting trying to carve out evening time for yourself without children who aren't tired running around the house is really hard as well. Because, you know, every, everything's a bit more um, markedly uh, stressed out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And we've had another question from a parent um, who I, I would imagine this is probably to do with lockdown and maybe having to work at the same time as having the kids around. But um, how, how should a parent answer when they're busy with something, but the child wants to interrupt? Like, is it damaging to say, you know, I need to listen to this or I need to do this, give me some time? Or is that the best approach? Or is there another way that you can sort of say to them politely, not now. It's like, it depends on the age of the child. I mean, my honest advice to anybody is survival at the moment. You know, I think this is completely unprecedented trying to work on homeschool children. I mean, I don't think the word damaging is correct. I don't think, you know, I think this is such an extreme situation where people are just trying to muddle through. I mean, we, you know, I don't get it right. I often lose it with my children, <laughs> meaning like, you know, when I'm trying to do stuff, it's, it's really hard. We do have conversations about, um, respecting each other's times and there are calls that cannot be interrupted and ones that can't there are trying to make you know our, our diaries fit around around theirs so that you know which is not always possible so they're getting supported and I think the most important thing is when you do snap and lose it is to to you know go back and apologize and have the discussion later. There's a lot of that going on in our house. I think, you know, it's survival, but reflect, you know, going back and saying, I'm sorry, I snapped at you. I was in the middle of a call. You know, actually I'm trying to work. I understand you're at school. I understand that this is difficult for you. You know, we're all just muddling through, let's work as a team. Those sorts of conversations kind of uh, afterwards are the things that are the most important for diffusing what is uh, an otherwise pretty difficult juggling act, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Bringing everyone together, I think, is really important. And saying, look, we're all not necessarily enjoying this process, or we're all feeling the pinch, so to speak. But I think it's very important to hear a parent apologise and explain why. Yeah. That's something I've always tried to role model. So I'm sorry I shouted at you. I shouldn't have done that. You know, I'm finding this very difficult as well because I think what a lot of people don't learn at an early age is how to express their emotions or that feeling emotions are, are valid, you know, even unpleasant emotions. Our entire kind of society is about masking unpleasant emotions. And that leads onward to 
a lot of mental health disorders because people end up with unhealthy coping mechanisms, alcohol, um, drugs, you know, cigarettes, or, or just bottling things up and not being able to process them. So as a parent explaining that you two are finding it hard and that you're finding it trapped and you've not dealt with this before, but that didn't give you the right to shout at a child and you're very sorry and let's all work together and try and respect each other. Having those sorts of conversations, I think, will, will be beneficial in the long run, you know, as opposed to damaging. Definitely. I think that's right. I, I think it's dialogue you've got to have, really. And that, that's yeah. the crucial thing. And, and uh, children basically like to see things to be fair. And, uh, and, and I think that's something which, uh, uh, if they know that there are times when people do, do, do lose it, they know there are times when uh, they're going to be that much more affectionate and also find more time for them. And I think they do realise what is going on in the house as well. So they're very perceptive. And they, they can sense an atmosphere. And the great thing about talking about it is that at least you're diffusing the atmosphere. It's not building up even more. And I think that's really the crucial thing, that, that you don't let things build up. It's best to, best to try and tackle it as soon as you can, really, um, if something's going wrong. And yes, you will get the tap on, on the shoulder saying, uh, can you help me um, with uh, the Florence Nightingale project? Well, Florence Nightingale was 1854, so that can wait just a few minutes, I think. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's a sliding scale of response. And I think you, 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 I mean, it's a bit like in teaching, um, if you have a class of pupils, there are some who inevitably have their hands up every minute of the time, and there are others who uh, don't. And so you learn how to manage those, those pupils in that particular way. So uh, I think it is um, getting to know exactly uh, what the mood is at the time. Okay. Um, how much time would you guys say is a healthy amount of time for children to be spending on electronic games? We mentioned obviously that it's a good way for people to be socialising with each other, but there's a very fine line with that, especially if we're trying to get a bedtime routine and you don't want to be playing too late. So what would you- I, I saw that comment and it's an interesting one. Firstly, I should just say, I, my children aren't old enough to be on games. Like, you know, so I, I feel like I've not had that experience as a parent, but during the first lockdown, I remember watching Louis Theroux and Louis Theroux was talking about how his children were spending way too much time on, on games. And that he then realised that, that is how they were. He was they were communicating with their friends. So what he saw at the start as them sat tapping at a device was actually the social interaction that his teenagers were having. And I've heard that quite a number of times from people. So I don't think there's a too much time. And I think it's really important. You know, I'm seeing in. I think my six year old is finding lockdown the hardest of any of us because she's just used to social interaction. So I imagine that the young people and the children are finding it a lot harder than adults. So I don't think there's a kind of right answer in terms of too much. I think if they are having social interaction, then that's really important. What I would say though, and someone else has put this in some of the um, comments above, you know, if, if it's affecting people's sleeping, there's a lot of evidence that shows that the blue light from screens can have an impact on the uh, way that your sleep and your REM sleep and quality of that. So I think if, you know, it's making sure that there's a good hour or window between uh, using a device and sleep and and just seeing whether the kind of gaming time is taking over other family activities or schoolwork and just you know like it is a bit muddling through but it's also about common sense and setting some boundaries around you know family life and interaction and trying to get outside and eating health and all of those things that Jim was talking about before in terms of eating and exercising and stuff like that. Of course. Yeah I mean I, I, th I think I think that's right Amy. I mean, it's interesting, um, and I talked about these groups of teenagers, the ones who perhaps are socially uh, conversational, as it were, and those who are more team team driven, as it were. I mean, there's there an example apparently the other day of this lady was taking her dog for a walk and two, two lads came up and said, could they take the dog for a walk? Because that meant that they could be in the park longer and have more exercise and the police wouldn't move them on, you know? So, so it shows how there is this need for um, activity and, uh, uh, lockdown means that it has to be digital in some ways and that you've got a confined time and you can be outside now so uh, yes it's a very good question I don't think there's a perfect answer to it um, but I agree with Amy that I think you've got to have uh, some time to wind down when you when you begin to think about sleeping you've got to, yes, got to go through a process I there. Think what's also interesting about games is 
it's the same with TV. Like I notice in my children when I switch the TV off that it, it completely rewires their brain. So you can have a kind of hysterical attack from a small child for switching the TV off because they're designed to be addictive. So it's also monitoring the behavior of if you switch it off, how people behave. I remember my father and how I know so much about mental health and got into it is my father's a psychiatrist. And I remember as a child, he used to be, he used to ban, do you remember the, the big breakfast? It was the channel four breakfast show. We were not allowed to watch it in a house. And I thought he was completely, completely, you know, being strange, but his thing was, it was all hype and enthusiasm and very short 30 second to a minute bits. And he said, watching that in the morning, why is your brain that way for the whole of the day? So he wouldn't let us watch it. Uh, and there's something to be said for that. So it's about, I think, monitoring your child's behavior. Is he or she happier when they've been interacting with friends or is there a sort of addictive thing? Because all of these things that we're using technology wise have got people, I mean, the attention economy, for every click you make on Facebook, 7,000 people have been employed to try and get you to click. So there's that balance between it becoming an addictive thing that rewires your brain and changes your personality when you, it's taken away from you and it being a helpful way of interacting with people. Definitely. Um, well, we well, frankly, of frank, frankly, I enjoy Paw Patrol. It's only five minutes long, so that's good. <laughs> A couple of individuals jump in with a couple of their suggestions. Um, so Mr. Barthold Moore has hopped in, said, I recommend reading fiction from a paper book before going to bed. So there you are getting rid of any phone or apps, Kindles, anything like that. No TV, no, no news. And it's for an hour before bed. And he said it's transformed his well-being. So they enabled him to wind down. So that's brilliant. Um, also, I've had um, another individual come on and say um, they've heard about a traffic like system for when parents are busy. So red means I can't be disturbed under any circumstances. Amber, I can be disturbed, but only if it's really important, not just maybe like, oh, I've lost a sock. Um, and green, this is time that I will spend with you. So parents have maybe put that up on, on like the front of a, on the back of a door if they've had to shut a study door or something like that. So that's another um, option that people have. Um, we've had another couple of more um, slightly more complex queries um, as opposed to some of the ones we've had already. So um, something that we can get into maybe a bit more, what signs of early mental health issues should someone look out for in children? So this particular individual has six-year-old twins, for example. Um, they've said there's a history of anxiety related illness throughout their particular family generations. They want to make sure that if um, ch their children are suffering, they can spot it early on. So what would be the sort of telltale signs that you would expect in, in children for anxiety as such? Uh, well, with, with all mental health stuff, it's generally a change in behavior. So some of the things we've talked about tonight, you know, um, uh, not being able to sleep properly, um, changes in diet, changes in, 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 in approach to food, being withdrawn, not communicating, how you tend to look at and look for um, the stages of, of early mental illness are, are behavior changes. So if you know your twin's behavior, it's starting to look at differences. I mean, what is, what is important about mental health is that we all have mental health, right? We see mental health as being a negative thing. It's quite odd because if you use the word health, you think of fitness and positive health. Whereas if we use the word mental health, it has a negative connotation in our society, but we all have good and bad mental health at varying times in our life. And we all have different levels of normal and different levels of ups and downs. So with children, it's very much about getting to know what their normal is, but then looking at changes in behavior for that. And, and you know, we were talking before about having good communication. So really being able to understand what's going on and being able to have that I do find that the mindfulness type approaches are useful with children because I think a large part of having good mental health, there's obviously a lot of chemical and, and um, genetic and hormonal factors towards it. But I think um, children are taught, well, all of us are taught at an early age to kind of ignore painful or difficult emotions as opposed to sitting with them and understanding them. So what mindfulness and those sorts of attention training things do is enable children to sit with and to, to be able to then articulate feelings and, and, and how they're feeling. And I think that's a good way to start as well, because then if there are changes, behave, if, they're, if they are feeling changes, they can articulate it. So I think, yes. I think that would be how I did it. With anxiety specifically, it's a slightly different 
um, show in that depression is obviously about being withdrawn and low mood and flat energy and not wanting to do things. With anxiety, you know, it's obviously uh, um, more anxiety can lead to panic attacks. So it's more, I think, seeing not being able to sleep properly, coming back from social interactions, anxious, feeling panicky, feeling nervous about things, starting to feel nervous about things that you maybe didn't before. Those are the sorts of things to look out for, but also recognizing for all of us as a collective. This is completely uncharted territory over the last 18 months. I think there's a huge collective grief process going on, you know, grief for the life that we had this time last year, and also a huge collective anxiety and trauma going on in that, you know, years or a year's worth of news about an illness we didn't understand and can't do and not being able to make plans and uncertainty, you know, and, and we talked earlier about the news is creating an underlying anxiety and, and trauma in, in, in most of society. So it's about kind of just picking up what's that and what's something else going on. Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Now we've probably got time for two more questions. So I've got them mapped out in front of me. So one of the questions is, how do you think schools can cultivate an environment in which promoting and cultivating positive mental health becomes the norm, especially when students are under so much pressure socially and with their work? So they've gone on to say, for example, um, they've been a student themselves recently and they're not entirely um, sure that teachers would necessarily accept, oh, I was wanting to switch off and get a decent night's sleep as a legitimate excuse for not completing homework for example so how how are schools do you think um are a, how are they able to cultivate an environment of sort of positive mental health and prioritizing that well i think you've got to have an openness really which uh, mm -hmm. is there and uh, i think the pupils have got to feel they they've got access to people on a regular basis and uh, i think one of the things i mentioned is this uh uh, well-being hub which is being launched for Brentwood yes. School I believe uh, I think yeah. it's being administered by the by the head of years there so um, I mean I, I take the point about uh, people saying well we had a deadline we've got to meet it and then the so-and-so says well I haven't been able to do it because I haven't been feeling very well it's a it's a, it's a question of uh, education on both sides really I think yeah. and uh, I, the fact that we are having these conversations now which say eight or nine years ago, we would never have done, shows mm. how we are moving on significantly, I think, in the way in which we view mental health. It is now something uh, which people are happy to talk about. I mean, I come from that age group, which are always regarded as the hardest to crack for mental health, as it were, because we've been told to get on with it, as it were. And uh, they, this is a, now an age group, which is realizing that they need help as well. And I think there's a, there's a, education is moving more positively towards promoting mental health and making it so it doesn't have that that uh, that tag of something people don't want to be associated with definitely definitely um, and we've had one final sort of comment uh, that's been made um so this individual is a doctor themselves um not necessarily focusing on children or psychiatry but in a speciality that involves a lot of mental health um, they consider it really important to talk about all mental health with their child, um, with colleagues and friends, and they do some voluntary work as well. Um, they've increasingly struggled with some situations, so lack of sleep, which we've already discussed, late night conversations stirring things up. I know that's not um, a brilliant time to sort of start conversations late at night. And also they've found that well-meaning friends actually sometimes fuel the situation. Um, are there any sort of tips that you can give that person to to come back to that? Obviously, we all really appreciate when friends try and help out. But sometimes if you're on the other side, you want to say, hang on a minute, that's not helping. And it, it can come across as being ungrateful. So I suppose it's that other flip side of it. I think if you explain to someone who's very well-meaning that you understand that their comments well-meaning, um, but that it's actually making you feel kind of and I, you articulate how it is then that's a good way of I mean I'm a big believer in in kind of honesty and openness so I mean 
there is a time and a place for everything and all of us are muddling through the most extreme circumstances we've had since you know well none of us were alive in the second world war or any of us i can see on the screen anyway so, you know <laughs> and i think there's understanding that and i think at the moment it's about a lot of self-care and a lot of boundaries so you know, if you are having a conversation just before you go to sleep, I think it's perfectly valid now to say, look, I really don't think this is the right time for this conversation. Let's pick it up tomorrow, you know, as opposed to having the conversation. I mean, I've had to do that. I've had to go out for walks. I've, I mean, we've all had to do things and, and also to stop conversations. I mean, there are friends of mine who I consider very good friends who I've not spoken to for six months. And that's partly because I'm in juggling mode with my own children and my own parents and my own, you know, trying to keep stuff going that I really can't take on anybody else's stuff at the moment. And also, I don't want to ring them up for the first time in six months and just project a load of my stuff onto each other. And that doesn't mean that I value the friendship less than I did six months ago. I think we are still in and it's been really annoying me, actually, because the newspapers have been talking about crisis point for the last year. And you think, well, how can you be in crisis for a year? But I think we are still still in the extreme part where you know good friendships I think afterwards sorry I think I'm gonna to have to cut you off because I think we're about to finish up um right. but thank you so much for your time both of you it's been brilliant and thank you to everyone who's attended um I really really hope that this has been useful um I don't want to cut off randomly apologies um I don't want to cut off randomly just in case uh, we lose everyone mid-sentence and don't get that final gem of information. Um, but I think the general message is that we're all feeling it. Um, children will be feeling it just as much as adults, if not more so. Uh, so keep the communication channels open um, and try and encourage them to follow positive self-care routines and, and follow them yourselves as well. So that then everyone in the family is, is sort of trying to better their mental health. Um, Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you giving up your time to be here. Uh, Jim and Amy, really appreciate it. And um, have a lovely evening, everyone. And we'll follow up with some of those links that we've discussed today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.